I don't know what role precisely God has called you to in the work of the gospel in the days ahead in this next season, but I know this, there is a part for each one of us here to play. There is a work for you to do. It will fit in with who God created you to be and with the life experiences that he has given you to walk through. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us today. And uh, Jonathan, I would love for you to talk to the person who says, I know that I would love to serve God in some way, but, but I don't really know in which ways I am spiritually gifted. I don't really know how I could be super useful to God and his kingdom. How would a person begin to figure that out? Well, I think the first step in that is making yourself available. You know, sometimes we can we can worry so much about, you know, what are what are my giftings? What has God called me to do? And we can be almost paralyzed by a, a sense of uncertainty about those things. But much of the time, as we make ourselves available, opportunities open up before us within the fellowship of believers and within the life of the church. You know, there are always needs within the local church. And if we present ourselves to to leaders in various ministries and just say, look, I'm, I'm available. I don't even know what I can do, but I, I, I want to say I'm available and I'm willing to serve. People with that attitude are such a gift to the church, and and things flow naturally from there. But I think the other thing I would want to add is it's so healthy and so good for us to seek counsel from others in this. So not to self-determine in my own heart, I am gifted at this, and I am going to do this, and I know that God has called me to do this. You know, God so often calls us through others within the local church and, and through our pastors and our leaders, and folks see within us gifts and capacity and character qualifications for different ministries, and they say, you know, I think you should consider this. And, and often that's a key turning point in the Christian life where we receive prompts like that from others, and particularly from others who are, are, are further on in the Christian life than we are. Well, we're going to continue to look at this today. I hope you'll grab your Bible. Join us in Colossians chapter 4 as we continue a message called The Gift of Gospel Partnership. Here is Jonathan. How can you deepen your involvement in Christian community and in ministry and in brotherly and sisterly affection and care in the days ahead? What practical steps can you take? What changes do you need to make? That's our first observation, the power of the gospel to create partnerships. And now next, we see the variety of roles in gospel partnership. We can't get hold of all the details of all the stories represented here in verses 10 and following. But one observation that comes to the surface very, very quickly is this. All these partners in ministry, they all have vastly different, hugely varying roles, each one. Varying roles, but but, but, but here's the thing to get hold of. They are each significant and dignified and God-given. Let's look at them together. In verse 10, we have Aristarchus, who Paul calls his fellow prisoner. Here's his great value here, Aristarchus. He is alongside Paul in a very, very tough season. In a place of potential isolation and great difficulty, Aristarchus is there. Precious and powerful thing, isn't it? Then we have Mark. Almost certainly this is the Mark who is traditionally identified as the author of Mark's gospel. We're going to come back to him actually in a moment because there's more to this story. But here we have this towering figure in the history of the church and in the scriptures, immensely privileged, isn't he, to pen a book of the Bible under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But, but then verse 11 comes Jesus who is called Justice. And, and here's one thing that jumps out about this man, Justice. Ready for it? We know almost nothing about him. That's the main thing I want to notice. We don't know what he did. We, we don't know what he contributed. He's not famous. He's not particularly noteworthy. And the point here is that some people are significant, all people, significant, precious. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. They are beloved of the family of God, but they attract no fame personally. Justice has his name recorded here in the scriptures, which is a great privilege. But in a way, I think he kind of stands for the nameless believer, the unfamous believer. He stands for many of us whom history will not especially remember, who will not have anything named after us, who will not be memorialized for any great contribution that we make, but who are precious and beloved within the family of God. Now, Justice does actually get grouped together with Aristarchus and Mark as being noteworthy for one reason. They were the only men of the circumcision, the only Jewish men among Paul's fellow workers. That is, if we pause to think about that, that is a stunning fact right there. 
Only these three fellow Israelites labor in the gospel with Paul. Just three? Let that sink in for a moment. Think about the ramifications of that. Of all the people of Israel whom Paul knew, of all those of his faith and nation, of all the Jews to whom the promises of God came, Paul has three only three who are co-workers with him in ministry. That is quite remarkable, I think. Don't you think that's remarkable? I think that could be very, very discouraging. Paul is out there proclaiming the good news that the Messiah of Israel has come. The promises of God to the nation have been fulfilled. He's preaching that good news. It's good news first for the Jews, isn't it? And only three fellow Israelites join him. But here's the thing about them, end of verse 11. They are a comfort to him. That's what Paul says. And it's not a lovely thing. You know, the, the Christian life can be tough. Do you ever find that? Christian ministry can be challenging. Do you ever find that? Uh, discouragements will come along at unexpected times and hit us hard. Do you ever find that? We receive regular updates from our missionaries. And mixed in with those reports of joy and fruitfulness and kingdom progress, we hear the reports all the time of opposition and difficulty and discouragement from different places all over the world. We had one such report this week that was heavy on our heart. And you will, you will know in your own experience of setbacks and trials and discouragements as you seek to minister and seek to serve in the place that God has called you to serve, but what a precious gift it is to have brothers and sisters who will stand alongside you and make it their business to bring you comfort. What a good ambition for each of us to be those who will bring comfort to other believers as they seek to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Not so long ago, I came into my office one morning. I was just discouraged that morning. Everything was just a bit sort of grayscale. I was struggling to see the positive side of things. I don't know if you ever have days like that. I do. Anyway, that was the reality that day, and I, I, I came to my desk, and sitting on my chair was a, a, a note a, and a gift. I saw the handwriting on the note from a distance, actually, and I recognized it right away, very distinctive handwriting. It was the handwriting of a friend who had gone out of his way to be an encouragement to me in my, in my Christian life 20 years ago and more. I've hardly seen him since then in the last 20 years. I could probably count on one hand the number of times I've actually seen him, but he was evidently passing through town. I had missed him, but, but there was the note and there was the gift for Jonathan with love from your friend, Hebrews 12, 2. Brief note, an encouragement from the Word of God, a good verse, thoughtful gift. And you know, the day it improved, I took heart from that. I felt that the Lord had, had prompted my friend, had used my friend in that way. You know, I sat down at my desk and got on with the work of ministry that was in front of me that day, and there was quite a lot of it. But I thought of him this week as I studied this passage and reflected upon Paul's comment here in verse 11 that these few friends had been a comfort to him. What a precious gift to be a comfort. I wonder who is the brother. I wonder who is the sister to whom you could be a comfort, an encouragement, a help in life and in ministry today in the coming days. Next comes Epaphras. You know, he's special now because he is a prayer warrior. Just have a look at Epaphras with me, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Jesus Christ, greets you, and here it is, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God, for I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. We've met Epaphras before in this letter. You may remember that. Paul was not the one who planted this church at Colossae, if you remember, who evangelized this group of people. It was actually Epaphras who did that. Who, he, he heard the gospel and went back to Colossae with the gospel. That's what Paul indicates back in chapter 1 and verse 7. It seems that Epaphras was from Colossae, went away, heard Paul's gospel, brought it back to the people of Colossae, and now is with Paul again. So here is someone who has been very, very central to the story of this church. He has been used powerfully of God in the lives of these people. And now he is at a distance, but he has a continuing part to play in the story, a vital part. Not as evangelist, not as church planter, not as church leader in the foreground, invisible, but as prayer warrior now in the background. And that actually from a distance. Notice what he does. He is, verse 12, always struggling, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. 
it's not just, you know, that Epaphras has the Colossians on his monthly prayer list and he, you know, he rattles off his list and then, you know, puts a, a tick mark in the column when he's done. It's not a perfunctory thing. No, he is on, he's on his knees and he is wrestling in prayer, struggling in prayer, says Paul. He longs and he desires, he's imploring the Lord that these people would stand mature in the faith, fully assured from God's word in, in the truth of all his revealed will. Paul says that Epaphras has worked hard for these believers here and in other places as well. And I take it that when Paul says that, he's not just referring to the fact that Epaphras was once there as a church planner, so he did some hard work back in the day. No, I think he is also referring to his constant and faithful ministry of prayer, which is itself hard work, by the way. It's spiritual effort in the Lord. And Epaphras, he's given himself to that. He has struggled. He has labored in prayer. What a ministry that is. What a gift to the family of faith. We have some here in our fellowship who have that ministry. Some of us at least know exactly who you are. It's a quiet ministry. But we thank God for you. We really do. And what a ministry to have. It may be that God is calling others. Maybe God is calling you to make that a particular ministry for the season ahead. Maybe you're not able. Maybe your health doesn't permit you to do what you used to do, but you could pray. Would you be a prayer warrior? Would you be an Epaphras among us? You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Gift of Gospel Partnership, part of our series, Walking Worthy. And if you ever miss a broadcast in the series, come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. While you're there, I hope you'll take a moment and check out our weekly e-devotional, connect with us on our social media links, and sign up for our newsletter. You're going to find those links and a lot more when you come to the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you joined us a little bit late, we're in the book of Colossians, chapter 4. Let's get back to the message. Here's Jonathan. Then verse 14, we have Luke, the beloved physician. Almost certainly this is the Luke who wrote Luke and Acts for us in the New Testament. Here is someone with a professional background of vital worldly skill, but also an extraordinary ministry as well. He took a surgeon's precision and he applied that to writing down accurately a record of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus, the multiplying ministry of the apostles in the early days of the church. God gave him a profound ministry and then used him mightily in his service. And then there's Demas, an associate of Paul, whose story actually does end in sadness. We're going to come back to him. Then there's Nympha, verse 15, who hosts a church in her home. We don't know too much about her, but we know this. The Lord gave her a home. He entrusted that to her as a stewardship, and our homes are stewardship, aren't they? A place where the church could meet. It was in the right location. She had that as a resource. She laid it at the feet of Jesus and made it available to the people of God. It's not mine, it's yours. How would you use this? It's a lesson for us in that, isn't there? There's more here, but I want simply to notice this. There is huge variety in the kinds of ministry and in the roles that God gave to individuals within these communities of faith, within these networks of gospel partnership. And I want us to see that, and I want us to draw personal encouragement from it, to be rightly inspired, I think, by it. You see, I don't know what role precisely God has called you to in the work of the gospel in the days ahead in this next season, I I don't know what role he will call you to play, what part he will call you to play in the days ahead, but I know this, there is a part for each one of us here to play. There is a work for you to do within the kingdom of God. It will be special. It will be unique to you. It will fit in with who God created you to be and with the life experiences that he has given you to walk through. I don't know if your experience will be anything like that of Aristarchus, verse 10, who was called to join Paul in the place of imprisonment to share in suffering for the gospel there. I don't know if you will be at justice. Verse 11, whose role will not receive headline attention of any kind, but for the fact that you comfort and you encourage other believers. I don't know if like Epaphras, your role will change over time. And by the way, that can be a very, very hard thing for your role to change, to move from the foreground into the background. He was a frontline church planter at Colossae. He's now an unseen prayer warrior, but he gave himself to that. He labored in it. Has the Lord called you, perhaps, to a new season of less visible ministry, less on the front lines in that sense, but perhaps he has called you maybe even to a labor of prayer on behalf of the people of God? Like Luke, has he called you to a vital ministry alongside your profession? 
Or maybe in place of profession, maybe he's called you to give up a lucrative career and to give yourself to vocational gospel ministry. Maybe some, and I trust and pray, there might be some in this room, the Lord's calling into vocational ministry. Maybe that's you. Like Nympha, has he called you to open up your home, to take the things of this world that the Lord has entrusted to you, and they're only a trust and a stewardship, to lay them at the feet of Jesus and say, how can this be used in the service of the gospel, in the work of the kingdom? Maybe there's something new in that for you in the season ahead. When we submit our lives to Jesus Christ, we know that he's going to use us. We know that there's work to do in the kingdom. We know that he will call us to serve. And what we see here in these verses is the wonderful texture of the variety of that service. The wonderful tapestry of gospel partnership. It's an exciting thing and it's a wonderful thing and it's a beautiful thing. We all have a place. We all have a role. We all have a part to play. What is your role? What might it be in the days to come? That's the variety of gospel partnerships. And as we close... I feel we must just make one more observation before we leave the text, and we must draw lessons from it. The observation is this, the messiness of gospel partnership. Gospel partnership, it can be really messy. Here's a truth that many of us know, and if we don't know it, we're going to learn it soon enough. Gospel partnership can be very, very messy at times. Christian community is often messy. Church can be messy. Things are rarely perfectly smooth this side of heaven. There are usually bumps along the way, aren't there? Some of them big enough to give us a pretty serious case of spiritual whiplash. Most of the time, many things go well. Praise God. We're thankful for that. There will be synergy in relationships, steadiness in godliness, momentum in ministry. That's often our experience. Praise God. But not always, anywhere. It's to be expected, of course. We're all sinful people. We are redeemed, we are being renewed, but we're far from perfect. And Paul's experience has something to teach us here. He mentions Mark in a seemingly positive light in verses 10 and 11. You notice it there. He was one of the comforters mentioned. That's great. It's a beautiful thing. But, you know, things had not always been smooth with Mark. There was a time when Paul would not have called Mark a comforter. Mark had accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey, but then Mark took off. He left abruptly. Paul and Barnabas, they had a big disagreement about it, a very deep disagreement about Mark. They actually parted ways. They separated because of that. That's all recorded in Acts chapter 13 and then chapter 15. But, but clearly now there has been some reconciliation and some healing in these relationships. The Lord has brought them through that, but it's been messy. It's been painful. It's been costly. Then Paul mentions that sadness, middle of verse 11, that only three men of the circumcision, men of Israel, have joined him of as fellow workers, shouldn't there be many more? I mean, wouldn't you be asking that question? It's a a surprise. It's a shock. It's a disappointment. Where are all the others who should be alongside me in in my ministry? Where are all those who should have a particular interest because of their background in this project, in this mission, in this ministry? Where are they? Ever wondered that in ministry? Where are the people who should be interested in this, who should be joining arms with me in this work? Where are they? It's messy disappointments come along. Then Paul mentions Demas. Just briefly there in verse 14, nothing too much to say, but he's clearly with Paul, clearly involved. One of the group all seems fine at this point, nothing to say. Paul doesn't know it at this point as he writes Colossians, but disappointment is in store with Demas just around the corner in a later letter of his, probably his last letter, 2 Timothy. Paul writes this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 9. He says to to Timothy, do your best to come to me soon for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. That's what's coming. Demas was with Paul now at the time of writing Colossians. Partner in ministry, no problem. But here's what's going to happen in Demas's heart, and the seeds are probably already there, and Paul didn't know it. Demas was going to fall in love with this present world. The, the gospel partnership, the excitement of evangelism, of ministry, of mission, the, the, the thrill that presumably once filled his heart, it would fade. It would lessen and diminish. And the things of this world would not be growing dimmer. They'd be growing brighter and would come to take precedence and he would take off. And Paul's heart would be broken. You and I, we are going to be disappointed by others who don't stay the course in ministry, in gospel partnership, who will abandon us who will abandon the work in which we're engaged, don't be surprised when that happens. It happens. Don't let it unsettle you. Be warned. 
be warned personally as well, but for the grace of God, you and I, we have ample capacity in our flesh to disappoint others, to let others down, to fail and to fall. Be watchful, be warned. The, the final note in, in all this is so human, so real. Did you notice it there? Paul tells the Colossian church, the whole church family, to give a prompt to what sounds like a slightly reluctant servant. Just imagine, this is public. This is the whole church, verse 17. And say to Archibus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. The Lord's given you something to do, Archippus. Come on, brother. Get on with it. And Paul says to the whole church family, you give him that nudge. You give him that prompt. He, he gets the whole church family on his case in a loving way. Isn't that wonderful? So human, so real, so authentic. And, you know, I've, just, I've got a list of names here I thought I'd just share publicly. Of, no, I'm joking. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but it's so human, isn't it? It's so lovely. And sometimes we just need to say that, don't we? Sometimes we need to hear it, too. Hey, hey why aren't... Brother, sister, why aren't you serving where God has gifted you to serve? I know you're gifted in this. There's a huge need. Where are you? Uh, why are you taking a back seat when you should be taking a front? You should be leading this thing. Where are you? Come on, friend. Time is short. The ministry is there before you. The Lord Jesus is coming back. These people, are, they're perishing. Come on. Let's get a move on. And actually, maybe this little word to Archippus is a word to you today. See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. What is the ministry that God has given you? What is the ministry that he is giving you? And what is holding you back today from fulfilling that ministry? It's no greater privilege. And there is no greater joy than to be part of living and vital and life-giving Christian community, to join arms with one another in the work of the gospel, to be partners in the ministry that God has given us to do. How would God use you? How would you make yourself available, perhaps in a fresh way in this new season, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve his people? Let's pray together as we close. God, our Father, what a privilege it is to be made part of your family through the Lord Jesus, through his shed blood, through his redeeming work at Calvary. What an extraordinary thing it is to be united to him by his spirit. What a humbling thing it is to be called to serve unworthy as we are. We pray that you would cause us by your spirit, moved by your grace, to give ourselves to Christian community and to gospel ministry in the days ahead. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Jonathan Griffiths, wrapping up our message, The Gift of Gospel Partnership, part of our series, Walking Worthy. And if you ever miss a broadcast in this series or you want to go back and listen to it again, you can do that at our website. Just come to EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, that's at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is able to be on this station, make the website, the podcast, and all the things that happen behind the scenes happen because of your generous financial support. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book written by Paul Mallard. It's called An Anchor for the Soul. And Jonathan, how would reading this book be helpful in our Christian walk? Well, if we're going to keep walking with the Lord Jesus Christ day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, we need stability. We need stability. And in order to have stability, we need to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And Psalm 22 is a wonderful Old Testament passage that points us to Jesus and teaches us about his work on the cross for us, entering into the depths of human suffering and bearing the cost of sin in our place at Calvary. I think for each one of us, taking the time to reground and re-anchor our faith in the saving work of Jesus is going to do us tremendous good, and I'd just love to get this book into your hands. Again, it's called An Anchor for the Soul, written by Paul Mallard, our thank you gift to you for your financial support this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or over the phone. Our number is 1-833-99-TRUTH. Again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org, and the phone number is one 1- 833-998-7884. You can also write us at Encounter the Truth, 2176 Prince of Wales Drive, Ottawa, Ontario, K2E 0A1. Or in the U.S. at Encounter the Truth, 215 North Arlington Heights Road, number 102, Arlington Heights, Illinois, 60004. For Jonathan Griffiths and our producer Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.